Hi. In this video, we're going to go through x-ray fluorescence, uh, how characteristic x-rays are produced, and then the limits of x-ray fluorescence as a technique. So let's take a look at some data, some x-ray data. So this represents typically what you'd get from a, a technique called energy dispersive spectroscopy or EDS and what you see here is on the y-axis the number of counts of a particular um, x-ray emission and then energy on this axis and you could see the range it goes from 0 to roughly 15,000 electron volts so you can see different peaks inside the spectrum and this piece of equipment has labeled each one of the peaks with this red line and then uh, the elemental indication here and you can see copper has several different peaks here's one here's another and there's another one over here uh, so what we're looking at is essentially characteristic x-rays that are produced and you'll see that this particular sample has a whole bunch of other elements as well you can see the lead multiple lead peaks there's, a, I think this is tellurium, a selenium. So in looking at the copper, this large peak, and then the smaller one right next to it, uh, I'll just tell you that this is what's called the K emission, and then this lower energy, roughly around two, one to two electron volts, is an, an L uh, emission. So these are the K emissions, these are the Ls, and this is what um, we're looking at in this video. So how are these produced? Let's take kind of a big picture look at copper and we're going to go to the periodic table and you're just I'm sure you remember that copper right here is a transition metal and uh, what we know about it is since it's in the fourth row of the periodic table is that it has uh, the electronic shell for a copper atom or the electronic structure for a copper atom looks something like this you have four s2 3d one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Three D nine. Although you know, I have to say that the copper is a funny element. This is probably three D ten and four S one. Um, that's in the electronic configuration of copper. So um, that's kind of the big overview of what copper looks like as an atom. And of course, um, when we think of copper, a big chunk of copper, we imagine that the copper as a face center cubic metal has a crystalline structure and this is just sort of a you know a, a illustration of a, a chunk of you know maybe roughly eight eight unit cells by eight unit cells by eight unit cells and if we were to focus down onto one of these unit cells we know that oftentimes you see drawings like this this is the least accurate of the drawings where it just depicts the lattice points and um, again we're looking at this one, one unit cell inside of the larger crystal and if we were to cut that up and pretend like the atoms are spheres which you know they probably aren't but uh, if we're pre pretending like they're spheres it, it looks something like this and the spherical part represents the electron cloud and we know that the electron cloud is largely not solid uh, at least as far as we know in terms of our, our most we imagine accurate scientific understanding. So uh, if we get closer to the atom structure, again, this is not to scale, but we imagine there's some sort of nucleus down here, and this scale is on the range of uh, picometers, excuse me, femtometers, uh, so 10 to the minus 15th meters. And then these electron clouds, and it's depicted here in these spheres, but we, imagine that they're actually not spheres they're they're uh, well maybe some of our some of them are spheres but right now let's let's just allow these spheres to represent different energetic levels of the electrons and so um, you see that the the closest one to the nucleus is often designated k uh, or n equals one the quantum principal quantum number is one then the next level which is um, designated l and you could see in this drawing it has uh, two, four, six, eight electrons. So this is kind of a, um, a conflation of the 2s and the 2p orbitals. And then there's the 3s, 3p, 3d. So under, and it's labeled m here. So they're all kind of grouped out here. So at the atom level, which is the level that we're looking at for um, x-ray 
fluorescence. This is the model that we use, knowing that the electronic suborbital might look different than this, but we're al allowing these spheres to represent different energy levels. So um, how were x-rays produced? Well, got a little video for you here. And what we, we know is that um, x-rays are produced by uh, an incoming primary beam, whether it's an x-ray or another electron, that has enough energy to eject one of these inner core electrons um, from its position. And then the remaining empty energy level is filled by an electron from a higher energy level. And by dropping down into that empty level, it gives off x-rays. So that's the story of it. Um, it might look like this, let's see, uh, in terms of transitions. So here is the K level. If we knocked an electron out of the K level, it would be replaced by either an electron from the L level, L alpha 1, L alpha 2, one of these different L levels. And, and the detail here shows that it's actually a P suborbital electron that replaces this ejected K electron or something from the next or n equals three electron level and that would produce a K beta x-ray. So um, I have a little video of this here. I don't really have one. It lasts um, seven seconds. Where is it? It's quite cute. Here we go. We'll watch this together. Okay. Let's do that again. Knocks it out. One is replaced and the x-ray is given off while it's replaced. So the ionizing radiation um, is typically x-rays or it could be an electron and you could see here in this sort of cartoon of the different scales of electromagnetic radiation that x-rays are about the scale of an atom and that's what enables them to um, well plus they have enough energy to remove an electron from the inner shell they roughly bombard the atom and eject that electron